Uh, normally, we would be at the booth and take questions, but unfortunately, the exhibit hall is closing uh, when this s workshop is over. So I'll try to take a couple of questions in the back when I'm signing the books, if, if I'm not able to get to them here. But anyway, so the stock market, as we're talking, I think the Dow is at new record highs today, nominal highs. Okay. There's no good news that actually came out today, although one piece of news that came out was that the unemployment claims uh, just hit a 42-year low. The number of people who file unemployment claims. And I'm trying to figure out, you know, why is this happening? Why are so few people uh, filing for unemployment, right? Wall Street is assuming, oh, this is a good news. This shows that we have a strong labor market. But you know what? I don't think so, because it doesn't make sense. The lowest in 42 years, right? why would that be? I mean. In a normal economy, people get fired just that they find other jobs, right? You need, a, you need, you know, you need people you know, moving around in the workforce. To me, this is, I just thought of this, I think the reason that this is happening is because nobody's getting hired. So you can't get fired unless you're hired, <laughs> right? And if you look at the jobs numbers that the government comes out with, right? Almost all the jobs, the government doesn't have any proof that they actually were created. They have something called this birth death model. I might have mentioned it yesterday. But let's say out of the 200,000 jobs that are created in a given month, 175,000, they don't, they don't have any proof that they were created. They're just assuming that they were created by businesses that got formed during the month. They don't know that they were there. Well, maybe these businesses aren't there. And maybe the fact that so few people are actually getting fired is more evidence that these jobs are just made up. They're just a figment of the imagination of uh, the guys at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Because it stands to reason, if we're hiring all these people, they're not all gonna work out. You know, when you hire somebody, maybe after three months or six months, you realize I made a mistake, I'm gonna get rid of that guy. And hire somebody else. If nobody's getting fired, there's a good chance that not that many people are getting hired. But it just shows you how people don't really look and try to figure out what's going on. Because everybody is convinced that the U.S. economy is recovering, even though it's sicker than it's ever been. Right? As I mentioned you know, yesterday, I'll do a little bit of that today, is that instead of solving the problems that the government created that led to the 2008 financial crisis, they made them all worse. Everybody is congratulating the Federal Reserve uh, for a job well done, and they have no idea how this experiment is going to end. Although, to me, it's not an experiment at all, because I know how it's going to end, because it's been tried before, and it's never worked. It's just that maybe our current leaders are arrogant enough to think that they can make something that's never worked work, because maybe they're smarter than the other fools who, who came before them. But they're not any smarter. In fact, they, they may not even be as smart. But it's still not going to work. But people look at the stock market at record highs, they look at this unemployment rate that has declined, and they think that the economy has recovered. But nothing has happened. We've, we've inflated the stock market, but that doesn't mean the economy is better. Just because stock prices went up. Stock prices went up in the late 1990s. That didn't mean the economy was in good shape. We rolled over in the recession. Stock market went up. In 2004, 2005, 2006, did that indicate a healthy economy? No, it was part of the bubble. Didn't stop the financial crisis because we had a record high in the Dow a year before. And just because the market is going up, it doesn't mean that the economy is improving. In fact, the policies that the Federal Reserve has used in order to push up the stock market, those are the very policies that have, in fact, prevented the economy from recovering. Right? That's why Main Street doesn't feel the recovery, because it doesn't actually exist. But when they, people look at these job numbers, and they say, well, there's 4.5% unemployment, 5.5% unemployment, they don't look and say, why is that? They don't realize that the labor force has shrunk, that millions of people are no longer looking for work. They don't have jobs, but they're not looking, and so they're not counted as being unemployed. Millions more are working part-time. They used to be working full-time. Back in the day, that would have counted as being unemployed. If you're a part-time job and you want a full-time job, you used to be considered unemployed. You're not considered unemployed anymore. If you work one hour a week, the government says you got a job. Even if you spend the other 39 hours a week looking for a job, you're not counted as unemployed. 
So you have this part-time workforce. I meant, you know, in, in part, that's caused by the desire of employers to avoid Obamacare. You know, when you pass a law that basically says if you have X number of full-time workers, you're subject to this huge cost, what are you telling employers to do? Have less than this number of full-time workers. So businesses are responding to the conditions the government created by changing the nature of their workforce. And if I'm going to have 100 part-time employees instead of you know, 50 full-time employees, I got to hire 50 people, right? Those are jobs that are being created. But I have to reduce the hours of the people I already employ. But the government is forcing you to hire more people by the fact that you have to reduce their hours. And now they claim credit for all these new jobs that are created, right? But these aren't good jobs, right? These are low-paying jobs, a lot of them are part-time jobs. And the real hidden secret of these jobs is that so many of them are going to people who used to be retired. Mm -hmm. They don't even want to work, but they have to. They need to pay their rent. They need to pay the electric bills. These costs have been rising, and they've got 0% interest on their savings. So a lot of people have to take part-time jobs. And that is the big lie when you have, have Janet Yellen trying to blame the decline in the labor force on, you know, on uh, the retirement of the baby boom. That's just an outright lie. The baby boom can't afford to retire. They're too broke. They're coming out of retirement. The percentage of people in their 60s and 70s working is the highest it's ever been. It's people in their 20s and 30s who are dropping out of the labor force. Right? The people who should be working can't get jobs. The people who should be retiring can't afford to quit or have to go back to jobs that they quit years ago. So you can't just look at the unemployment rate and say the economy is good. And even the stock market. Why is the stock market at record highs? Is it because stock markets have record earnings? No. A lot of these companies have declining sales. Why are the stock prices going up? Because there's not as many shares left outstanding because the companies bought them back. And people look at earnings per share. So if you don't have as many shares, then you can distribute your earnings, even if the earnings are declining, over a smaller share base. Where are, the, where are these companies getting money to buy back their stock? They're borrowing it. How can they borrow some cheaply? Because of the Fed. So these monetary policies are responsible for the rising stock market, not a vibrant U.S. economy. Some people might say, well, if we have a strong economy, we have a strong stock market. No. The market is going up because of the Fed. The whole phony recovery was because of the Fed. Right? The government. How is the government able to spend all this money? We have huge deficits. Where is the government getting the money for these deficits? From the Fed. Either the Fed was monetizing directly when they were doing the three rounds of QE. Right? The Fed's balance sheet went up to four and a half trillion dollars. Right? It used to be $700 billion or so. So all that extra money was created and spent by the government. Right? They spent it in the economy to artificially goose the economy. But now we're in debt. Right? That was just a short-term fix, but now we're going to have to pay the money back. And you have the fact that the, the Fed is subsidizing new debt because it's keeping interest rates so low. The federal government only has to pay you know, half a percent, one percent, quarter of a percent interest on its treasury bills. So if you look at the total cost to the US government of financing the national debt, it's a fraction of what it was when Ronald Reagan was president, even though the debt was a lot smaller when Ronald Reagan was president because of the way it's financed. But what the US government has done is place itself in a position where any meaningful increase in interest rates will bankrupt it. Right? If interest rates go up to 4 or 5%, the U.S. government is going to have to default on its treasuries. Either that or it's going to have to default on Social Security. It's going to have to default on Medicare by not making the payments. So it, there's not going to be any easy choices. And of course, if interest rates went to 10% or 20 they have to default on everything. Right? But all of this is artificial because of the cheap interest rates. So you've got the government propped up, you've got the economy propped up through excess consumer spending. Where about this automobile bubble? Where, where are people getting money to buy cars? The government owns all the auto finance companies. And it's 0% you know, interest rates. People are taking out seven-year loans at 0%, buying cars. Could they buy any cars without the 0%? The few people that can still afford to buy a house, could they buy it without a 35 4% mortgage? No. The only thing keeping the home buyer in the game, the individual home buyer, is the artificially low interest rates and the fact that the government still guarantees mortgages and you can get government guaranteed mortgages only putting three and a half percent down. 
But the government created this phony recovery based on cheap money, which is so ironic because that's exactly how they created the last phony recovery. It was the cheap money supplied by the Fed that fueled the housing bubble, even though the Federal Reserve still doesn't make that connection. When I talked to Alan Greens and Ben Bernanke last week, he basically said the Federal Reserve had nothing to do with the housing bubble. It had nothing to do with the financial crisis, that his policies had no impact, that it was just a mere random coincidence that we happen to have a housing bubble when they had interest rates down at 1%. Well, if the Fed is that clueless about the damage it did in the past, why would it be any more uh, understanding of the damage it's doing now? Because the policies of Bernanke and Yellen are off the charts worse compared to what happened under Alan Greenspan. And I was very critical, uh, you know, the entire time, once Greenspan lowered interest rates to 1%, I was extremely critical of all the damage that was being done to the economy because he did that. You can't see the damage right away, right? Because people are, don't know they're making mistakes. People are making investments that they shouldn't make. They don't realize. You get these mixed up signals. You screw up the free market when you price interest rates too low. You've got to let the market set interest rates so that the, the price is right and you get a proper allocation of resources. But when interest rates eventually go back to where they need to be, now all the mistakes that were made when interest rates were way down, they get liquidated and you go through a recession. But the recession is the market's way of fixing the problems the government created. So the 2008 financial crisis was actually a good thing. Right? Because we, that was when the market was trying to solve and fix all these problems that years of bad monetary policy had created. Now, unfortunately, the, the cure wasn't a, you know, didn't, didn't work fully. It wasn't allowed to run its course. It was interrupted by a bigger dose of the disease, right? by more of that toxic monetary policy. Only instead of taking interest rates to 1%, we took interest rates to zero. And as a result of that, right, we, and we kept, them, we kept interest rates at zero for six years. They're still at zero. And we had three rounds of quantitative easing. So because of that, the U.S. economy is far more screwed up now than it was at any point in 2007, 2008. And that ended extremely badly. So this is going to end worse. But the question is, or the, the important part for the people in this room, is how is it going to be worse? How is this crash, this crisis, going to differ from what happened in 2008, or even what happened in 2000? Because you've got to understand that if you're going to get it right financially. And I believe that the Federal Reserve understands now that this, that this bubble economy is too big to pop. Right? Now, why do, why, do they, why do I think they know it this time? Well, we've supposedly been in a recovery for six years, according to the Fed. Yet interest rates have stayed at zero the entire time. They've talked about maybe raising interest rates based on various things happening. But if those things ever happen, they make an excuse. If they set up a goalpost, they move it. Right? Uh, and then they play these word games. You know, they'll be patient. They're going to wait a considerable time period. Yet they haven't raised interest rates from zero, not even to 0.25 or 0.15. So to me, it seems that they're never going to raise rates, and I've been saying that for years. The markets don't know that. The markets just expect the Fed's going to raise rates. But what they don't know is that they can't because they don't understand the nature of the bubble. If we had a real economy, we could raise rates, but we don't. We have an economy dependent on cheap money. And it has to be really cheap because if you've been at 0% for six years and you get all kinds of debt based on that, right? You can't even raise interest rates to 2% or 3% because it's not cheap enough. Right? You're, you're hooked on a certain amount. Right? If, you're, if you're addicted to, to heroin and, and your pusher just gives you, you know, half of what you're used to, it's still heroin, but it's not enough heroin. Your body needs what it's accustomed to. This economy is too levered up to even withstand 2 or 3% interest rates. Right? So I think the Fed has been bluffing the entire time about rates. Meanwhile, everybody's been expecting, well, the economy is going to get better, the economy is going to get better, and then the Fed's going to raise rates. Well, we've already passed the peak 
of the recovery, and we're headed back into recession right now. People are still in denial about the fact that the U.S. economy is headed for recession. Personally, I think it's been a recession the entire recovery, because I don't think the numbers have been accurate, because the economy has only been growing about 2% a year. That's, you know, each year 2.1, 2.2, 2, one year was 1.6, ever since 2000, the recovery began. But that's because the government assumes that inflation is basically non-existent. Well, what if the inflation rate is really 3 or 4%? What if the numbers that we're getting are not accurate? Well, then the economy is contracting. We've been in a depression. And it certainly feels like a depression to most people, right? And if the labor force is shrinking, if you look at real income, it's declining, real household net worth going down, home ownership, the lowest it's been in since 30 years. I mean, people are broke. Something like, I read that 25% of people who are renting now are spending half their income on their house, on their, on their rent. I mean, that, that, I mean, that's the highest it's ever been. The number of Americans living paycheck to paycheck is the highest it's ever been. Half of Americans have no savings. We have record numbers of people on food stamps and on, on welfare. I mean, how can that be? And on disability? I mean, we have more people collecting food stamps now than when the recovery began. I mean, how do you have a recovery that puts people into poverty? It should be lifting them out. So the anecdotal evidence suggests that the economy has been in contraction, right? And how does the government, you know, fake the numbers? Because the, G the, the GDP deflator is actually lower than, this, than, this, than the CPI. In fact, for the first quarter, they assumed that inflation was negative. Right? They said inflation was minus 0.1, that the cost of living went down in the first three months of this year. And, and they needed that just to get the GDP to go up slightly, which, of course, they're going to be revising it down. So I think we've been in a a depression this entire time, because I don't think the U.S. economy has grown at all, um, but people, say, people think that it has, but even that slow growth is slowing down. And if the Fed wasn't able to raise interest rates back then, how are they going to do it now? 2015 is probably going to be a much slower year for GDP growth than 2014. In fact, it's very possible that the recession is already started, because Q1 is going to be a big negative number. And Q2 may be negative also. And when we, we first started getting information about the first quarter, people are blaming it on the weather. Right? But it's not the weather. That's just an excuse, because people don't want to acknowledge the situation. Now, when it's revealed that the economy is a lot weaker than people thought, there's going to be calls for the Fed to stimulate the economy. Right? Especially since everybody thinks that what they did worked. And so they're going to do it again, which is QE4, which is coming. And nobody's expecting that, although nobody expected QE3 either or QE2. I did. Right? I, and in fact, the minute they did QE1, I was saying, you know, well, they're going to do QE2. Right? I was saying they're going to have more QEs than Rocky movies. How did I know that? Right? How did I know that? You know, there's been six Rocky movies, right? How did I know they would do all these QEs? Because I knew they wouldn't work. And in fact, it's more than just not working. It actually makes the problem worse. It's like putting out a fire with gasoline. I know that if you throw gasoline on the fire, not only won't the fire go out, but you're going to have a bigger fire on your hands. And if your solution is to throw more gas on that bigger fire, right, if I know that every time the fire comes back, all you can do is throw gasoline on it and assume that it's not going out because you didn't throw on enough. Right? So they're going to say, look, it almost worked. We were almost there. We just didn't have it big enough. We did do another round of QE that's even bigger than the last one. And then we'll get escape velocity. Then we'll be able to stop. Right? Like the whole, it's like, if I just drink enough alcohol, I can stop drinking and stay drunk. Right? <laughs> it, it, it doesn't work that way. Right? When you stop drinking, you, you get a hangover, and you, or you, you, know, you go into withdrawal, whatever, the drugs. There's no way. That's why the, reco the recovery, phony recovery, is already evaporating, because we, we stop QE. Having 0% interest rates isn't even enough. We need that constant Fed pumping more money in, buying up more bonds, buying up more mortgages, to keep this phony economy from imploding. Now, eventually, of course, like any drug, if you do enough of it, you end up overdosing. So you can't do it forever. And the longer you do it, the worse it's going to be when you stop. And of course, the worse it's going to be if you never stop. Right? So that's the predicament that we're in. We, we, we can't stop. 
Um, but if we, you know, it's like we're, we're in this bicycle and we're going towards a cliff, right? And, you know, they, they would say like quantitative easing, that's like the training wheels on this bicycle. And they would say, let's take these training wheels off because we don't need them anymore. And I was always saying, no, 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 no. Quantitative easing aren't the training wheels. They're the only wheels this bike has. You take off those wheels and the bike's going to fall over. That's what's already happening. But I said, you got to take off the wheels because falling over is better than going over the cliff because that's where the bike is headed if we don't take off the wheels. But either way, the rider is going to get hurt. But I think it's better to fall off than go over a cliff because that's where you're probably going to die. But we're probably going to go over that cliff. You know? But as investors, we want to get off that bike. right? So what's going to happen is sometime in probably in 2015, all of this talk about rate hikes are going to be gone. Right now, people are speculating, are they going to raise rates in June? Are they going to raise rates in September? And I've been saying for a year, they're not going to raise rates at all. Doesn't matter. Right? And I, I said, I don't know what the excuse is going to be, but they're going to come up with a reason. They're going to blame it on something. Because uh, they want to pretend that they were, you know, they were going to raise rates all along. And now something happened and now they can't do it, right? Because they can't come clean now and tell the truth that we can never raise rates, it's QE infinity, because then the bottom would drop out of the dollar right now. The reason that it hasn't happened is because people are still convinced that this is temporary, right? But it's not temporary, this is a permanent program. So what will happen is the talk of rate hikes is going to go to talk of when is the next round of quantitative easing and how big is it going to be. I think it's going to be bigger than all the other rounds combined. Because again, you know, as you do it, you get the economy more addicted and more levered up and now it needs even more credit, more cheap money than before. I also think that it's going to be combined with some kind of Keynesian style uh, fiscal stimulus that we haven't really had, although we've had it and that we've had these huge deficits. But guys like Paul Krugman say, look, they're not big enough. We need even bigger deficits. Right? A trillion dollars a year wasn't big enough. Right? We need bigger ones. Uh, and so we might do that. And then I think you're going to see uh, a tremendous decline in the dollar. And, and, and the dollar is the story. Right? And the real crash is going to be a crash in the foreign exchange markets, which spills over into the bond markets and the entire U.S. economy. How it impacts the stock market is hard to say in nominal terms. Because the stock market is going to be trapped between two opposing forces. One is going to be lots of money printing, lots of inflation, which tends to prop up prices for everything, which would include stocks. But it's also going to have the downward pressure of a collapsing economy, high inflation, high unemployment that undermines its earnings. Right? So, you know. The stock market in the United States is going to have different uh, forces bearing on it. Plus, it also might be staring at tax increases. You know, we already have some of the highest corporate tax rates in the world, uh, but, you know, higher taxes, depending on, especially if we get Hillary Clinton or some, you know, in the White House, there's a good chance that corporations could be vilified in, in this class warfare, especially as the economy gets worse. And so we could be looking at higher tax rates, which obviously uh, would undermine the after-tax earnings of U.S. corporations, which is really what's more important. You know, it's not what you earn, uh, but what you keep. But what's going to happen is all the people who have been buying up dollars, right, because they, they believe this fairy tale. They actually thought what the Fed did worked. And now they're going to realize that it didn't work. And that it can't work. Because if we had interest rates at zero for the entire business cycle, when can we ever raise them? And if the balance sheet went up to four and a half trillion, and then at no point did it, did it ever shrink during the recovery, and then they ratcheted it up to seven or eight trillion you know, to stimulate for the next recovery, it could never end. Right? And people will think, realize that this is a permanent policy, not some kind of temporary thing that actually worked that actually created legitimate economic growth. You know, we had the, last month, we had the worst trade deficit in U.S. history, not counting energy. And we got a boost from energy because oil prices went down. But X oil was the worst trade deficit ever. I mean, that, that doesn't evidence a recovering economy. 
That's a very sick economy that is incapable of producing. Right? We had productivity now just fell for two consecutive quarters. And, and most of the economic statistics that have come out this year, we haven't seen numbers this bad since the Great Recession. You've got to go back to 2008 or 2009 to find the type of data points that are already coming out about the U.S. economy. Right? And, and the Fed hasn't raised rates yet. They just talked about it. Imagine what would have happened to the economy had they raised rates. That's why they didn't do it. Right? Because then, then they would have had to slash them back to zero very quickly, and they would have lost a lot of their credibility, although I don't know why they, they still have any credibility. But, so the people who have been buying dollars are going to sell. And the dollar had this huge run, just like it did in the late 1990s. The dollar index went up to 120. Right now it's about 94, something like that. But it got up to 99 a couple of weeks ago, so it's starting to come down. But why did it go up to 120? in the 19, late 1990s, because people believed in Alan Greenspan. They called him the maestro, right? They believed in the new era. They believed this nonsense about budget surpluses as far as the eye could see. Remember that? We were going to pay off the national debt. People actually believed that in 1999. They were worried about what we were going to do when we ran out of treasuries, right? And I said, this is crazy. And, but people believed it. But that bubble popped. And the dollar went down by about 50%. The dollar index went from 120 to about 70 until the financial crisis saved it temporarily. The dollar had another big decline, too, in the 1970s. Between 1971 and 1980, the dollar lost about 70% of its value. That was when we severed the link to gold. We went off the gold standard and the dollar collapsed. This coming decline in the dollar is going to be much greater, I believe, than either of those two declines. And it's going to have a very profound impact, not only on our investments, but it's going to have a big impact on our portfolios right? and our, our, our standard of living. You know, Americans don't realize how much of their standard of living they owe to the overvalued U.S. dollar. Right? We get to print money, and we get to use it to buy stuff that the rest of the world has to make. Now, it doesn't require any effort to print money. There's no capital, there's no human labor, nobody has to work, nobody has to make anything, right? But, if, but the, the, the goods that we're buying with that paper, you know, require real effort, real resources, real capital, real equipment, human labor. We buy actual products that make our lives better, that we can use. And in exchange, we give people pieces of paper that they can't use. The only thing that they can do with dollars is get more dollars, right? They buy a treasury, and now we pay them interest. And when the treasury matures, we give them more, more, more you know, we, let, we have them roll it over. And they just give us the money back, they buy more treasuries. Right? They can't buy any products because we're not making enough products for our trading partners to you know, square their books. So we have a huge uh, benefit. We get to live an artificial standard because we get to consume without having to produce. Producing is the hard part. Consumption is the easy part. It's the fun part. It's the reward. We've got the rest of the world doing our work. But when this dollar tanks, and people realize that we have no ability to stop it from falling. Look at, the Russians had to raise interest rates to 17% you know, a month ago to stop the ruble from going down. We raised interest rates to 20% in 1980. That's what stopped the dollar from falling. It had a 70% decline. We finally halted the decline by raising interest rates to 20%. We have no ability to do that anymore. We simply have too much debt at too short a maturity. So the only thing that they can do, if the government wants to postpone this, they have to sacrifice the dollar. That's all they can do. Right? If they want to stop the stock market from imploding, if they raised interest rates at this point, if they let interest rates go back to normal, if they went back to where they were in 2007 before the financial crisis, the Fed were to move rates back up to about 5%, that would usher in a much worse financial crisis than the one we had last time. It would be so bad that not only would banks fail, but the depositors would actually lose their money. Because the FDIC would not have enough reserves to make anybody whole, and they couldn't get the money from the Fed. Because the Fed would be bankrupted itself. If interest rates went to 5%, the Fed is gonna have a you know, trillion dollar loss on its portfolio. What do you think bonds are worth? If the Fed has got a 30-year government bond yielding two and a half, and the 30-year bonds are yielding, in a 5% short-term rate, the 30-year bonds are yielding 6 or 7. What do you think your bond is worth that's yielding 2.5?
Right? The Federal Reserve is broke itself. The government also is broke. The government has to default on its treasury bonds. I mean, it would be nothing like 2008. It would be so much worse. Right? So the only way that they can prevent that from happening is to sacrifice the dollar. Because they can, they can buy up stocks, they can buy up bonds, they can keep expanding the money supply and preventing all these prices from falling. They can do that indefinitely. But the one price they can't control is the value of the dollar. Because eventually all the dollars they have to print to buy up everything else, I mean, you know, if no one wants that money, then the dollar crashes. And that's what you have to prepare yourself for. And initially, when the dollar really starts to decline, and I think you know, once we take out 70 in that dollar index, you know, if we go right now, I said we're at 94, if we end up in recession, if these next few quarters come out weak, right, and they can't excuse it based on the weather, and we end up in recession, the dollar's going to tank. I mean, it's, it could lose between now and you know, mid-year, it could lose another 10 or 20 percent of its value. And that's just getting started. Because then once we have to launch another round of QE, right, that's when it's really going to go down. And of course, this is going to cause gold to just take off from this. You know, it's been basing around the 1,200 level for a couple of years now. You know, gold went from under 300 up to 1,900, right? had like a 12-year run, uninterrupted run. You finally got some of the you know, mainstream investors that piled in the gold once it kind of got up to 15, 1600. So they kind of got in late to that party, and they've all left now. So all those speculators are gone, and now you actually have some short sellers in the gold market. Um, but all the gold that they sold has been absorbed by the China and places like that. So that gold's not going to be resurfacing. When the speculators want to buy their gold back, there's no gold around right, to buy. And a, and a surging gold price is also going to further undermine the dollar because as people see the price of gold rising, that causes them to lose even more confidence in the dollar. But when they realize that the Fed has no ability to control inflation, right, that if inflation gets to 4 or 5 percent, the way they measure it, right, if it, if it gets there, that there's nothing that they can do about it because they can't raise rates. And in fact, I'm certain that they've already tried to you know, lay a foundation for I inflation, to get people to accept inflation by, by trying to create this false you know, enemy of deflation. Right? They say, we need to fight deflation. Right? Why do they need to fight the cost of living going down? I mean, what's wrong with the cost of living going down? Nothing. That's what makes people wealthier. That's, what, that, that's evidence of a growing economy, a vibrant economy. People can buy more stuff for less money. But they're trying to convince us that we need prices to go up. That, you know, if your landlord raises your rent, that's a good thing. The worst thing that your landlord can do is tell you that your rent's going to be lower. Right? Or if you go to the store, you know, you know, if the prices, you know, I mean, businessmen have sales all the time. But according to the government, they should mark stuff up instead of down and, and hope people come rushing to buy the higher prices. Right? People respond to low prices because they don't have an infinite amount of money. The reason the government is trying to make this stuff up and try to pretend right, that falling, price, falling prices are bad is because they know prices are going to rise. And they want to get the public to accept a higher rate of inflation, even though the public is already complaining about prices rising too rapidly. They're just looking at the official measure of inflation. But as that inflation rate moves up, and right now the Fed has this 2%. You know, they used to have, 2% used to be kind of like a benchmark where if it got to 2%, that meant you had too much inflation. You know, it wasn't that if you had 1%, you needed to make, make it go up to 2%. But now they're acting like 2% is a target that they're trying to hit. That if you, if you have less than 2%, the Fed has to do something to make the inflation 2%. And, but they're saying, you know, if it gets above 2%, they might raise rates. No, they won't. Just like they, they never raised rates when unemployment got below 65 When it gets to 2, they'll let it go to 2.5. They'll let it go to 3. Because they can never get out in front of it. If inflation is 3% and you want to bring it back down, you can't raise interest rates at 25 basis points. If inflation is at 3, you've got to go to 4 or 5 if you want to bend that curve. You've got to get out ahead of it. And then if they let inflation get to 5, they've got to go to 7 or 8. But we're, we can't do that. So when people perceive this, right, then the dollar is going to tank. It's going to just accelerate. And now the Fed is going to have to print even more dollars because interest rates are going to start to rise on all the bonds they're not buying. Let's say the Fed is buying treasuries. Right? What about corporate bonds? 
if inflation is running at 5 and 6% and you got a corporate bond that's yielding 4%, you got to sell it. Right? And now corporate rates are going to be under pressure. Corporations can't borrow money now. They're all levered up. So now what is the Fed going to do? Well, they're going to buy corporate bonds. What about municipalities? What are they going to do? All these states are loaded up with debt, and the states are dependent on cheap cost of financing that debt. Well, if inflation picks up, they can't borrow money cheap anymore unless they get it from the Fed. So pretty soon, the Federal Reserve becomes the buyer of only resort. It's not the buyer of last resort. So the, the balance sheet is ballooning. The money supply is screaming, and there's nobody who wants these dollars. So where could the dollar index go? 60, 50, 40, 20? Who knows how much lower the dollar? It could go to zero, or practically, if they don't do anything about it. But what you have to do is prepare for it. And understand that the dollar collapsing is not a bad thing for the rest of the world. It is a horrible thing for Americans, because that's all most Americans have, is dollars. Right? They have their paychecks, they have their savings, they have an annuity, they have cash value in a life insurance policy. All this stuff gets wiped out. And th these are the people who are going to be left holding the bag from all these government programs. Look, when the government borrows more money than it can repay, there's two choices, an honest default or inflation. And they don't have the integrity for an honest default. That's not going to happen. Right? So they're going to print money. And that means anybody who has that money is left holding the bag. That's how the default comes through, in your purchasing power. So you have to protect your purchasing power. You can't be focused on the principal. Right? You can't be saying, hey, I've got a million dollars and I don't want to lose that. Because what is your million dollars? It just represents what you can buy with it. You might not be able to buy anything with a million dollars in five years. How do you know? What you want to do is protect the purchasing power that currently, you know, is involved in that million dollars. What can you buy with a million dollars? You want to preserve that, your ability to buy the things that you need. But the dollar going down is not necessarily a bad thing for the world. Because when the dollar goes down, somebody else's currency goes up. The dollar's not going down in a vacuum. I think the currencies that are going to rise the most are the countries that are the most productive, that are producing all the things that we're consuming, that are lending us all the money that we're borrowing. They have the vibrant economies. They have the legitimate economies. They have more economic freedom, fewer regulations, lower taxes, populations that aren't dependent on government handouts. They're going to be rewarded with a higher currency. And that means they're going to be able to start consuming their own production. So instead of all these products being exported to the United States, they're going to stay in the countries where they're manufactured, and they're going to be consumed by their own people who will be enriched by the increase in the purchasing power of their currency. And that will be the loss to Americans. Now, Americans are going to have to left, you know, defend for ourselves. We're going to have to produce stuff if we want to consume it, and that's going to be pretty much impossible. We don't have the infrastructure. We don't have the factories. We don't have the trained workforce. You know, so we're in a very, very weak position as, as a nation, unfortunately. Hopefully, when this crash comes, politically, we'll understand the nature of it and be able to reform our, our laws, our taxes, our regulations, so that maybe we can dig our way out of this hole. But that's, you know, that's beyond the crisis. In the meantime, you know, I forget how much, I don't have a lot of much time, what we're doing at Europe Pacific Capital to protect you is building portfolios primarily of foreign stocks, but not just foreign stocks randomly around the world. We're looking at countries like Singapore, like New Zealand, like Hong Kong, like Switzerland, or Norway, we have Australia, some, some parts of South America or Southeast Asia. There are a handful of countries that are not as screwed up as all the other ones, right? Where they, their governments are not nearly as reckless, their central banks are far less profligate, you know, where they have high savings rates, lower taxes, fewer regulations, and we find good assets, good solid companies in those countries, utility companies, uh, telecommunication companies, infrastructure, resource companies, companies that pay good dividends, right? That you collect in Swiss francs or New Zealand dollars or Singapore dollars, currencies that are going to be gaining in value as the dollar tanks so that your purchasing power is maintained because it's not dependent on what the dollar will buy but on what those currencies will buy and again those currencies are a function of real assets so even if there's inflation there you have a hard asset an actual company with infrastructure and plant equipment that has value and can raise prices
But you also want to recognize that you have to own companies that are positioned to benefit from the emerging market consumer. The American consumer is done, right? Remember the expression, shop till you drop, right? We did it, right? So we're not going to be shopping, right? But other people will be. The people who have been saving their money, they'll be shopping. The people who can buy things without a credit card, right? They'll be the ones doing the shopping. So you have to own companies that are going to profit from that change. Right? So you've got to be invested outside the United States. And what we do that's differently at Europe Pacific Capital is we don't just buy U.S. foreign stocks that have an ADR on the U.S. market. The best companies, the best valued companies, don't bother to list on the New York Stock Exchange. So you can't find them if your universe is limited to what's trading in America. So we, we buy stocks for you directly in foreign markets. And the way we do it differently than other brokerage firms is we don't do it through market makers in the US. We do it directly in those markets and we save you a lot of money because we bypass the US market makers. And you can work with us in two ways. You can have a brokerage account or you can have a managed account where I manage your portfolio. The minimum for a managed account is $250,000. It's an individual portfolio of foreign stocks. If you can't meet that minimum, I can still manage your money because I have a portfolio of mutual funds. We have seven mutual funds under the Euro Pacific Capital family. All of these funds are managed with a value oriented focus and trying to position you for the way the world is going to look. Not the way it looks now, but the way it's going to look in a few years when you have this dollar crisis and the US crisis and the nature and character of the economy, the global economy changes. So we have funds that focus on the emerging markets. We have funds that focus on dividend paying foreign stocks. I have a gold fund. That's another part of our strategy is in the precious metals. I think everybody should have some of their money in physical gold, maybe five or 10 percent, own some actual gold and silver that you have. But I also think there's an incredible opportunity right now in mining stocks. I think there are a lot of stocks you know, that were up in the last run of the mining stocks from 2000, 1999 to 2008. You had stocks up five to tenfold, some more. I think this time around you're going to have stocks up 20-fold or more, 50-fold. I mean, there's going to be such an explosive move because these stocks are priced for a collapse in the price of gold based on people who don't understand what's happening in the U.S. economy. So you want to have some exposure to that sector because I think the type of returns that are going to be delivered there are going to be enormous. But I also think you're going to get tremendous returns outside the gold sector. Just being invested in these foreign stocks because not only do you get the appreciation of the stocks, and if we're buying stocks at good values that are not trading at inflated PEs like the U.S. market, and these foreign markets too, the, the people who run the companies are, 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 are compensated fairly. They don't just get a bunch of stock options like we do in America. They're actually running their companies for the long-term interest of their shareholders. Right? So you have better corporate governance and, you know, in, in these countries and much lower tax rates. Corporate taxes in these other countries are lower. And almost all the stocks that we own, when we get our dividends, they're qualified dividends. So you still get the lower US tax on income that was taxed at a lower foreign corporate rate. So you, it's much easier to get value and to get five, six, seven, eight percent dividends when you're investing in other countries that treat their corporations a lot better and where the management is incentivized to reward shareholders with an actual dividend instead of just a promise of stock appreciation that may not materialize. So you're still going to get growth in our stocks. You're going to get the dividends and you get the foreign exchange. And right now it's a great time to be adopting my strategy because you had this rally in the dollar, 20, 30 percent rally in the dollar that is not going to last and is purely based on the anticipation of a recovery that's never going to be there. It's like a mirage of a recovery. And as people wake up and realize that it's not real, the dollar plunges. But before that happens, you want to take advantage of it by getting rid of your dollars and acquiring these foreign assets. You know, you'll hear on the news people are talking about, uh, well, you could take a vacation, right? You got the dollar has gone, has gone up. It's a good time to take a European vacation. It's a better time to buy assets in Europe, right, in Switzerland or in Norway, because these currencies have gone down. And it gives you an opportunity. And the only reason they've gone down, or the dollar, has, those currencies have gone down, is because speculators have pushed them down based on the anticipation of higher U.S. interest rates. And also based on the belief that these other countries are going to keep their rates low. They're not. Other countries are probably going to start raising rates. I think a lot of the countries that lowered interest rates this year are going to be raising their rates next year. Countries like Canada, or Norway, or New Zealand, or Sweden, or Switzerland, or Germany, all these countries are going to be raising rates because inflation is going to be picking up. 
right? They, 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 they've now gone into quantitative easing in Europe. There's, the reason that we didn't get as much inflation in the United States when we did our quantitative easing is because we exported a lot of it. A lot of the dollars that we printed ended up you know, buying bonds. Right? The inflation went into the stock market, it went into the bond market, and because we are not honest in the way we report about inflation. But I think the rest of the world is going to react to higher inflation by tightening their monetary policy because they can afford it. America is unique in that we can't afford. Is that zero back there? Is that what you're holding up? Because I don't have my glasses. That's a zero. That, I guess that means I'm out of time. Is there, something, is there someone talking in here after me? Oh, I don't know. But anyway, but I want to, I don't know if we have time for questions. Yeah, no, she's shaking her head. All right, but basically, the bottom line is, I don't think there's a lot of time left now to get your, you know, your portfolios in order because the dollar has already started its slide, right? And I think it's going to keep coming down as we get more and more bad economic news to pierce this illusion that everything is, everything is good. Right? And as more and more people figure it out, we get more and more pressure on the dollar. It has been falling just about every day for the past month, right? after having risen you know, for 10 months in a row. So now it's really starting to fall. So it's creating some sense of urgency because it means that the stocks that I want to buy for you are getting more expensive. Gold prices are going up. Right? Gold stocks are going up. So all the things that I want to buy are getting more expensive. The good news is they're still relatively cheap. They're still lower than they were a couple of years ago. But I don't think it's going to be that way for long. So you've got to act. That's why it's important that everybody fill out these cards so that the brokers can stay in touch with you and talk more specifically about all of our strategies, our managed accounts, our mutual funds. We have a mutual fund wrap program where if it's a $50,000 minimum, I'll manage your account in all my funds. And we waive all the fees on the funds and just charge a fee for the wrap program. So it's a unique product that you can only get here. But you can buy my funds. You can buy my funds at Schwab or Fidelity or E-Trade or Scott Trade. Other, you know, they're on platforms, so you don't actually necessarily have to have an account with me to do it. But I prefer that you do it through me because then you're going to work with my representatives. It's the same cost no matter where where you uh, where you buy it. Uh, and then shift gold for your physical precious metals. Right? And also, I have we have a Perth Mint program at Europe Pacific Capital if you want to have your gold stored in Australia, and they'll do it for no storage charges, which is, which is good. Anyway, let me, let me wrap it up, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sign uh, any books in the back that you happen to purchase. Thank you.